Good morning. It is the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. And once again, as we gather together to worship God, our world continues to battle a pandemic. We are inundated day in and day out by images of pain and suffering, of violence, of hatred. It is in that kind of a broken world that we come together. And it is that broken world that we must pray for. And so let us worship God. Give thanks to God and tell of God's good gifts. We will we sing, sing praises, praises for all that God, God has done. done. Let your hearts be joyful. We will, will seek God's, God's presence, presence continually. continually. Call to mind God's wonderful works. We will always remember, remember the, the blessings, blessings of God and glorify, and glorify God, God forever. forever. Let us pray. Eternal and ever-loving God, deep is our desire for what is true and enduring. Deep is our need to see clearly. Deep is our longing for you, O oh God, because in you we live and move and have our being. You are the root of love, the fountain of knowledge, the source of wisdom, the path of right living. You are the beginning and the end of all things. Our thoughts cannot comprehend your mystery. And so we worship you in humble praise, holy God, ever three, and ever one. Although you satisfy our deepest desires, O oh God, we confess together that we have often turned away from you. And so we say, we have sought meaning in shallow places. We have clung to old hurts and familiar habits. We have nursed anger and envy. We have been self-absorbed and lack compassion. We have turned our backs on those in need. Forgive what we have been, amend who we are, and guide us toward what we may become according to your grace. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now the collect for the day. Compassionate God, you touch those rejected by the world and those despised by false piety. Guide us away from a false purity which hides misshapen hearts and lead us to the joyful feast in which we are all renewed through Jesus Christ, the beauty of God's faith. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. 
Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He f- said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. We say together the song of thanksgiving. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord Lord is my stronghold and my my sure defense, defense, and he he will will be be my my savior. savior. Therefore, you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation. And on that day, you shall say, Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things, and this is known in all the world. Cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion. Ring out your joy. For the great one one in the midst midst of you you is the the Holy Holy One of Israel. Israel. A reading from the book of Matthew. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, be raised And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, Let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, last week, Last week in the book of Exodus, we saw the baby Moses floating down the Nile River in an ark into the hands of Pharaoh's daughter. The beginning of 
the narrative which would define the people of Israel, the beginning of a narrative which would define God's salvation history, a narrative which spoke to God's people then and ought to speak to God's people today. This morning, we, we have moved ahead many, many years. The baby has grown up, became an adult, who has had to flee Egypt because he saw an Egyptian citizen mistreating a Hebrew, and he killed him and buried him in the sand. And, and he left Egypt to get away from Pharaoh to save his life. He married a daughter of a priest of Midian and set about a simple life, being a shepherd, taking care of sheep. This is many, many years later. And the Pharaoh he was afraid of had died, but for the people of Israel, things had only gotten worse. They groaned out, they cried, they, they cried out in despair to their God. Why are you letting this happen to us? Where are you? Why don't you come and save us? And God heard their cries. God noticed their pain and God had a plan. And so we have to kind of picture, we have to picture this story. See, I believe that, that, that Yahweh, God, was the originator of special effects. I mean, Steven Spielberg had nothing on Yahweh. So here's the moment. Moses is on Mount Horeb. Now, Mount Horeb translates, the word is wasteland. He has the sheep. He is in a wasteland. He's going about his business when suddenly he sees a bush that is burning and, and not being consumed. And he, he, he leaves the sheep turns his back on the sheep and walks over and basically says, now that is really cool. You don't see that every day. Now, when God realizes that he has reeled him in, this voice, God speaks to Moses from the bushes. And he says, Moses, Moses. And, and when you hear a bush speaking to you, of course you're going to say, here I am. And then God goes on to say to him, listen, I've heard the cries of your people. It's bad. They are oppressed. They're dying. And, and I've heard them. And I have come down to save them. And my guess is, at that point, Moses' heart soared. God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was going to going to fulfill what he had promised all those years ago to Father Abraham. And it was good. And, and, then, and then Yahweh said, so listen, this is what I'm going to do. You're going to go to Egypt and set my people free. And, and Moses said, what? You are kidding. Really? <laughs> you are kidding. And, 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 and God says, listen, Moses, I'm not kidding. I will be with you. Remember those words, I will be with you. Because throughout scripture, the mention of God's presence means everything will be fine. Because God's presence, it, it just changes everything. Moses, at this point, is not totally convinced. And he says, listen, okay, say I do the stupid thing and go back to Egypt, go back to a land of genocide and murder. And I say to our people, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me here. They're going to ask, what's his name? Well, that's a stupid question because nobody knew his name. Why would they ask? But Moses is fishing and stalling. And so Yahweh says to him, I am who I am, which can also be translated as I will be who I will be, can also be translated as I will do what I will do. And frankly, I don't think it's an either or, I think it's all three, because what what God is saying to Moses is if they ask you a question, you tell them that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob said to me, 
I will be your God. I will do what I will do. So trust me. So trust me. After a lot more special effects and a lot more convincing, Moses went on his way to Egypt to set God's people free. Okay, let, let's, let's flash forward to Matthew's gospel story today. And, and again, we remember back, back to last week uh, where we had the encounter where Jesus said, who, who do you say that I am, guys? And Peter said, you are the Christ the son of the living God, and that's a glorious moment. It's a glorious moment. And then with our reading today, Jesus begins to talk about what that meant, what it meant for him to be the Messiah, that he was going to go into Jerusalem, that he was going to be arrested, he was going to be beaten, and they were going to kill him. And Peter says, what, what the, seriously? No, and, and what translates is God forbid uh, can also be translated as God will protect you. God will be with you. God will not let this happen to you. And, and then we see what's, what's often considered a stern rebuke by Jesus of Peter. And I, I, I'm not sure it is. See, do you remember back early in in Matthew's gospel, the time of temptation, when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan to take the easy way out, tempted by Satan to take the easy way around hunger and power and success. And in each case, in each of the three temptations, Jesus said no. No, no. And I think what we see happening today is at a time when Jesus is about to make his way to suffer and die on the cross, and and Peter says, no, 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 God forbid, God won't let this happen to you. It's another temptation to take the easy way out, to avoid suffering, to avoid having to confront the forces of evil, And I think Jesus sees that as yet another temptation by Satan. And so says to Satan through Peter, get behind me. There can be no easy way out. And then, and then the words that are really important for us, he says to them, listen, not only is there no easy way out for me, there, there's no easy way out for you. If you want to be my followers, if you want to be my disciples, if you want to claim my name, if you want to be part of the kingdom of God, then you've got to take up your cross. You've got to take up your cross and follow me. And I was reading Caroline Lewis this week, a brilliant, a brilliant professor of homiletics, and she said this. She said, taking up your cross or having the audacity to wear a cross is it, it, not about showing the world who you are. It's about reminding yourself of what the world needs you to be. I think that's what Jesus was saying to his disciples. The world needs you to be a people who are prepared to stand against power that will silence and oppress. The world needs you to be a voice to speak for those whom the world would crucify. The world needs you to renounce, to renounce systems and individuals and leaders who put themselves ahead of the needs of others. The world needs you to be prepared to call a thing a thing, to name pain and to name the cause. Take up your cross and follow me. What does that mean, I wonder, for you and for me? 
I, I, I came across this, this past week, what for me was an incredibly moving picture of the Hill of Crosses in Lithuania. In the 19th century, when the Russian Tsars were killing Lithuanian citizens, they began to put crosses on a small hill as a kind of passive resistance to the violence, the murder, and, and the oppression. Over the years, that went on and on. During the First World War, in the period between during the Second World War and during the Soviet occupation of Lithuania, that hill with the crosses carried to it became a place where they would pray for peace, pray for an end of suffering, pray for an end of murder, pray for peace for them and, and for the whole world. Now the Russians and later the Soviets, they did not like this hill of crosses and they bulldozed it three times to try to stifle them and to stifle the faith that put it there. My friends today on that hill in Lithuania, there are in excess of 100,000 crosses, 100,000 symbols of passive resistance, 100,000 symbols of what it means to take up your cross and to follow Jesus. I believe, I believe that in the world we live in now, we would do well to listen to the words of Jesus today. If you want to be my disciples, if you want to claim my name, if you want to wear a cross, if you want to be part of the kingdom, then take up your cross and follow me. I believe that we as individuals and we as church, we have got to make up our minds what it means for us about just how we stand up against the powers that silence and oppress. Just how do we become the voice for those the world would crucify? How can we with integrity stand against institutions, systems, and individuals that put themselves ahead of the needs of the rest of humanity? How can we begin in an effective way to name the pain to name the cause and to stand against it. What does it mean for us to take up our cross and follow Christ? I believe an aching world is waiting for us to figure that out. I believe in our country, in this continent, and in our world, the lonely, the hungry, the poor, people of color, people who are oppressed for whatever reason, they are literally dying for us to get it right. Go, go into Egypt and set my people free. If you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. God always has a plan. God hears the cries of the broken and the wounded. But in the history of our faith, God requires human agency, you and I, to set God's people free. Amen.
we say together, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. The prayers of the people. O God, in whom we live and move and have our being, we come to you in prayer as the summer season draws nearer to its close and we prepare for an autumn filled with many changes. We give you thanks for the occasions that we have enjoyed this summer, savoring the beauty of creation right outside our doors. Thank you for the chances we have had to catch up with family and friends and whatever opportunities to travel, recreation and restoration have been possible. We recognize how blessed we are to live in Canada and so we are grateful for each moment in which we found rest and relaxation in the summer season. Today we remember those for whom this summer has been difficult, those still isolated by the restrictions because of COVID-19, those who go hungry or face violence in forgotten corners of our own community and around the world. Those whose business is are struggling, who have to figure out how to be inviting and safe at the same time. And those who are uncertain how to engage with friends and neighbors and still be wise and careful in this strange time of pandemic. May we each find one courage to face tomorrow in your company. Lord, in your love. Hear our prayer. O God, Jesus walked the road of suffering with so many in pain and grief. We remember those whose lives we have faced, crises, who have faced crises this summer. Though tragic death and unexpected loss, through critical illness or injury, through pain or problems that seem to have no end. Surround them with your comfort and compassion. Lord, in your love, hear our prayer. O God, Jesus often faced the many demands and the pressure from his critics. So we pray for all those who have not found rest this summer for leaders trying to figure out ways forward to care for their communities when there are no examples to follow, for those whose jobs and responsibilities have changed and every day presents a new challenge. And we also remember all those who seek work in these un uncertain economic times. May they know your strength and assurance day by day. Lord, in your love, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. O oh God, we need to embrace your presence, each in our own way. Bring healing and peace to our lives and to this world you love. Open our eyes and our hearts that we may offer healing and peace to those we encounter, in the name of Jesus the Christ. And now, joining our prayers and praises together, we pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Go now and follow Jesus in the way of the cross. Rejoice in hope. Hold fast to what is good. Persevere in prayer. Do not be overcome by the evil and pain around us, but overcome evil with good. Stand against injustice and cruelty wherever you see it. And as far as possible, live peaceably with all. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you really can make a difference in this world, that you are able with God's grace to do what others claim you cannot do. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love and pray for today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen. Amen.